Welcome to Strip Coverlet, where we squeeze the bigger picture out of literature. I'm Adrian Fort, and we are here for another poetry discussion, a poetry discussion which will take place in two separate playlists here on the channel. Number one, obviously, being the poetry discussion playlist, where I hope to bring this playlist to 500 videos this calendar year. <clears throat> Pardon me for... I'm still sick. I'm still under the weather. I can't get over this. Um, but also, the Emily Dickinson playlist, which is approaching 100 videos strong, I believe. But <clears throat> today, we have a poem I don't believe I have ever talked about on this channel. And it's one of the more haunting Emily Dickinson poems, once you really get down to the bottom of things. The world is not conclusion. And it reads as such. The world, this world, is not conclusion. Pardon me. This world is not conclusion. A species stands beyond, invisible as music, but positive as sound. It beckons and it baffles philosophy. Don't know. And through a riddle at the last, sagacity must go. To guess it, puzzle scholars. To gain it, men have borne. Contempt of generations and crucifixion shown. Faith slips and laughs and rallies, blushes if any see, plucks at a twig of evidence and asks a vain the way. Much gesture from the pulpit, strong hallelujahs roll. Narcotics cannot still the tooth that nibbles at the soul. Now, <clears throat> I have uh, been on record saying, look, Emily Dickinson is my favorite poet. I think it is almost, uh, I think she's the greatest poet of all time. I don't even think Shakespeare compares to her. And I know that sacrilege in the English literature sort of hall of academe. I don't care. I have said many, many times, if there is a sin to be found in Emily Dickinson, it's that her poems sort of wither away. They start very, very strong. Emily Dickinson has some of the best opening lines in all of literature, some of the best opening couplets that you will ever find, but sometimes, after that, those poems sort of wither away. This poem, almost in verse, in verse of that, if you were to take this couplet here and get it tattooed on you, narcotics cannot still the tooth that nibbles at the soul. No one would question you. That's a completely tattooable couplet. <clears throat> what does it mean? Well, narcotics. Narcotics cannot still the tooth, which means that narcotics, when you're saying still the tooth, you're talking about stopping the pain. You're talking about a toothache. Narcotics cannot take away that pain of the tooth that nibbles at the soul. You ever had tooth pain? No matter what you do, it sucks. And if you do anything, it's even worse. You breathe in, it hurts. You eat something cold, it's awful. You eat something hot, terrible. Maybe your mouth gets dry. Not a good thing. Tooth pain is always there, regardless. You don't get to say anything about it. Maybe you can put narcotics on it. But what is being stated by the author here is that when that tooth pain is something nibbling at your soul, something that you know you should be doing, something that you know you should experience but you are not, if that is the pain, Narcotics will not quell that. Narcotics won't take that pain away. Now, it would be very easy at this point to forget the rest of the poem. Like, 
With many Emily Dickinson poems, it's easy to take the opening couplet and forget the last of the poem. We're not going to do that. Narcotics cannot still the tooth that nibbles at the soul. What are we talking about? This world is not conclusion. I think there's two ways to take this. <clears throat> One, which the poem seems to hint at in certain ways, that this world is not conclusion. There's other world. The world we have is not conclusion. A species stands beyond, invisible as music. But I think there's another way that this poem also takes this line. This world is not conclusion, meaning that this world is question. Why, how could you get there? Philosophy. Don't know. Sagacity must go, and through a riddle at the last. So, just as much as this poem is telling us, there's more to this reality than we know. It's also saying that knowing, knowing, having the knowledge, is not all that there is to do, we should experience. Because if there is that little gnawing in your soul, if there is, where are we at? If there is that little bit, if there is a sore tooth nibbling at your soul, <clears throat> it means that there is something spiritual, you could say. There is something experiential, one would probably be inclined to think. There is something existential at risk in, well, existence. <clears throat> and if we know that we are not making those strides towards that thing, whatever it is that we feel in our soul must be done, if we're not making those strides towards that thing, no amount of narcotics that we decide to dollop on top will get us any nearer a pain-free state. They say that a, a, a large proportion of anxiety, when we feel anxiety, is just that we know there's something else we should be doing, and we know that we're putting it off, and we know that we know that we're putting it off. So people who feel anxiety at an existential level, <coughs> people who suffer with this anxiety on a day-to-day -day basis, on a task-to-task -task basis, people for whom this is <coughs> this anxiety truly limiting, they know that there is something they should be doing. Now, on the sort of day-to-day -day level, that might be anything, right? That might be getting your tags renewed on your car. It might be that you know you have to do the laundry, and it's been piling up for a week and a half now, and you haven't done any laundry. It might be that you know you got to go to the grocery store, and you know there's not that much in the bank. And this inflation doesn't make it easy. Those are anxieties. Those are that tooth which needs stilled. But if it is something deeper than that, and it is, we all have that. And if we don't have that, it just means we're going to get it way worse, way later, with way less opportunity to fix it. When there is something on that spiritual level in that way, it has to actually 
be addressed. And the way that we address those spiritual, those existential nibblings at the soul, maybe it's not with answers. Maybe it's not with conclusions. Maybe it is by opening ourselves up to further questions. Emily Dickinson goes on about crucifixions in this poem, about pulpits in this poem, about hallelujahs in this poem. If you read her poetry with any level of depth, you can read it and enjoy it and, and find that it's good poetry without really examining it. But if you read it with that depth, it's almost impossible not to conclude that this is an individual who is struggling with questions of religion in the deepest ways. Mother Teresa. Did you know that Mother Teresa had these same questions? Mother Teresa went to... Um, oh, now I can't remember who it was, but one of these... Uh, upper level clergyman said, look, at night when I'm alone and I question it, I really can't feel anything there. And she was told, that's good, that this trial of the soul is necessary. She was told that that brings you closer to the faith. Now, maybe that's your faith. I'm not saying right or wrong. I'm just saying that even with someone like Mother Teresa, that was there for her, that nibbling at the soul, no amount of narcotics that she could have put onto it. Mother Teresa, whose entire existence was wrapped up in religiosity, went to question her religion. Because there was something nibbling at her soul. That tooth nibbling at her soul had a cavity, had an infection, and she had to figure it out. It was not, at the end, about the conclusion. It was about acknowledging that the questions will come regardless. Is that what life is about? Is life, is, is life about the questions? Is life about the experiences? <clears throat> How often do we engage in experiences if we already have the conclusion? If we have all of the answers, if we know all of the knowledges, why go out and engage? We already know what it's going to be like. We already know what's going to be the outcome of the experience. <clears throat> so in this very way, so sports, for example. <clears throat> if you already knew who was going to win, you wouldn't play the game. <clears throat> now, you got a pretty good idea sometimes. There are betting lines for that very reason. But if you already knew who was going to win... You would not play the games. Therefore, the reality of the thing is about the questions inherent to the process. This world is not about conclusions. <clears throat> That's what we have here from Emily Dickinson. This world is not conclusion. This world is not answer. This world is the only place we live. This world, as we are, is the only thing we have. You can believe that there is another world. You can believe in an afterlife all you want. We, in our corporeal forms, cannot access it. Can't do it. <clears throat> this world is not conclusion.
That's all I have for this poetry discussion. If you enjoy or appreciate what it is that I do here on this channel, hitting the like button really does help me out as it tells YouTube to share this video with other literature lovers. And if you find yourself here by chance but not designed, literature is the only thing that I talk about on this channel. Dropping multiple videos a week, there's poetry every Monday. And I hope to have you back for the next one.